Hello, my name is Dr. Matthew Collin. I'm an instructor for the Dynamic Genome Sections 3 and 5, and I'll be covering gene evolution and homology today. Evolution is change over time through the mechanism of natural selection. Here is a small image of Charles Darwin, the person who came up with the concept of evolution by natural selection in conjunction with Alfred Russell Wallace. And here is a variety of Darwin's finches standing on branches that show evolution within a small group of birds. So these finches live on the Galapagos Islands and an ancestral finch was either blown over or flew over from mainland South America to these volcanic islands and then diverged to adapt to various niches on the islands. So some of the birds are have very fine beaks for picking up very small seeds. Others of them have very large beaks for picking up and cracking larger nuts. Some of them have very sharp beaks for poking into pieces of wood and pulling out insects. And this is an example of evolution by natural selection as the finches diverged and spread out into their different habitats over the volcanic islands. Evolutionary biologists use homology or homologous traits or shared derived traits to categorize organisms based on evolutionary relationships. So mammalian, here are some examples of mammalian traits, such as the ability to produce milk, they have hair, they all have a single jawbone, they have three inner ear bones, and they're warm-blooded. Here is a meerkat showing some of these traits. Over here are spiders, so the characteristics of arachnids. Spiders, ticks, and mites. They have eight pairs of legs. They don't have wings or antennae. They have a combined head and thorax called a cephalothorax, and they have an abdomen. And these are all traits that they share. They also don't go through metamorphosis. They usually just molt and grow bigger over time. These traits can be used to construct evolutionary trees. Here are examples of two types of trees. They're both for mammals. And this is a block tree. This is an angle tree. And these mammals are grouped based on shared traits. So for example, here you have monotremes. Well, monotremes are the outgroup, are the lowest types of mammals, so to speak and that they're the only mammals that lay eggs. Think about platypuses versus you have marsupials, such as koalas, kangaroos, wombats. These organisms, these animals, produce live births, but they're very small, and then they have to migrate into a pouch where they live for quite some time before they're fully developed. And then the rest of these mammals are placental mammals that all give live births. Um, and each one of these are more closely related to each other than they are to these over here. How do you read an evolutionary tree? So here is a phylogenetic or evolutionary tree. They're basically groupings of relationships. This, in this tree, time goes from here to here. So this is recent, this is older. These are called nodes, so you have nodes that are closer to the top, or you have more deeper nodes down here and here, or even this node down here. This is a very diverged species because these are all groups of moths, individual moth species, and this is an outgroup, which is not a moth, so it's a caddis fly. They're closely related to moths. These are tips. And these here are branches. So you can have very long branches that represent a longer time of evolutionary divergence or very short branches. In this case, these are very two closely related moth species. This is Bombyx mori, which happens to be the domesticated silk moth. Um, and these are other moth species. And so these, here's higher nodes versus deeper nodes. These are more distant evolutionary events. 
These are internal branches. These internal branches have numbers on them that show the amount of support that the data gives for each of these particular branches. In addition to using characteristics such as phenotypes, you know, hair, milk production, and other phenotypic characteristics, genes can also be used as traits to construct evolutionary trees or phylogenies. You can use the presence or absence of a gene. You can use changes in amino acids, SNPs, indels, NTEs, as we discussed in experiments one and experiments two, also can be used to infer relatedness between species. Down here you see an alignment, and this is an alignment of three different spider silk genes. So this is from the same spider, and you have or major ampullus bedroin 2, and you can see here is the nucleotide sequence up at the top and the single letter amino acid translation down here below at the bottom. And if you look closely, this is just a portion of the gene. Here is the start codon, and it goes through 149 nucleotides. And scanning along, you can see here is a you know, conserved amino acid residue here. These amino <clears throat> acid residues are conserved as well, but there's a synonymous SNP. So the amino acid doesn't change, but here you have CTT, but beneath it you have CTA and CTA as well. And here is another synonymous SNP. So here's GCT versus GCG. Farther along, you can see other amino acid changes. So here is a non-synonymous. So the amino acid has changed. And so you have the G, but then we have a C to a T and then G, G, or T. Here is another non-synonymous change. So here is C, this, this G, C here, this changes the amino acid. Sometimes, due to evolutionary distance, you can't always use nucleotides sequences, and so sometimes it's easier to look at the amino acid sequence for an alignment. Here's a single letter amino acid translations for a region of this particular gene, and here you can see conserved amino acid residues. So here is cysteine, and they form disulfide bonds. So this is a very conserved residue here and here. You have other highlighted residues. So these D and E, those are acidic amino acids. S is serine, A is alanine. And you can see other conserved residues here and here, as well as here and here. These residues probably serve some function across these different species and within the gene. Additionally, you can have homologous genes. So homologous genes are genes that are shared across different species. You might imagine that spiders, they produce silk, and the spider silk genes are all related to one another. So up here you have major ampullate or minor ampullate spadroin from a variety of species. So this is minor ampullate spadroin from Latrodectus hesperus or the Western black widow. And here are three different versions of it. Here are two different versions of Latrodectus geometricus. And these minor ampullate spadroins are homologous. When you have homologous genes that are due to speciation events, same gene but in different species, they're called orthologs or orthology, and they result from speciation. Sometimes though, with genes, you have gene duplication events, and this occurs fairly frequently within organisms because 
some genes have one function and then the gene duplicates and it allows it to one of those genes to take on a new function. So spiders ancestrally produced one type of silk and the more complicated orb weavers produce up to eight different types of silk. Here you have dragline silk, major ampullus bedroan two and major ampullus bedroan one from Latrodectus geometricus, which is the brown widow, commonly can be found in Southern California, and Latrodectus hesperus, the black widow, which also is native to California, and you have major ampullus one and two. These two genes are paralogs of one another because they are related, but they're same similar genes at different locuses. Similarly, back up here with the minor ampullate, you have three different copies in the same organism. Those are paralogous because they occurred from a gene duplication event. In our current project, we're going to be knocking out genes. And we want to make sure that we're knocking out only the gene that you've been assigned, not knocking out other genes. So we need to see, can we find genes that are closely related to ours, similar nucleotide sequences, so that when we design our guide RNAs, we don't knock out a whole host of genes. Rather, we only want to target the one gene, because if we knock out a variety of genes, it'll be much harder for us to tell how important that gene is because you haven't you've knocked out multiple genes rather than one. So we're going to do alignments to determine and ensure that we're not knocking out other genes at the same time. Thank you.